Megan Guggen and Naman Mehrotra from Safety Wing. Megan Guggen is the head of platform operations. She is a remote work advocate and speaker, YouTuber, marketing strategist, and consultant for remote work leaders. Naman Mehrotra is the head of product platforms. Naman focuses on building and scaling health benefits globally through partnerships and product integrations with HR and freelancer platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Megan and Naman. Hey everyone, this is uh, Naman and uh, Megan from Safety Wing. Uh, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, as thriving as a digital nomad and uh, also talk a little bit about our company, Safety Wing, that uh, is a fully distributed remote company. Um, and we're really excited to be on Evolve Beyond Borders. Uh, what we're going to be having today is just a conversation and cover a bunch of uh, topics that, that might be relevant to, to you. Uh, and we're, we're super excited to get into it. Uh, so without any further ado, let's start off with uh, some brief intros and, and backgrounds uh, about, about ourselves. And uh, Megan, maybe you can go ahead and talk a little bit about your experience and how you landed up being a digital nomad. Uh, thank you for that introduction. As Naman said, we're very happy to be here at Evolve Beyond Borders. There definitely needs to be more conversation around how companies are going global and going more remote. So this is very relevant to the work that we do both within the company we work for Safety Wing, as well as within our own personal lives. So I've been traveling while working remotely, and I wouldn't necessarily call myself a digital nomad because I've always had a home base. And it's more so that I would take trips, usually to escape Canada's winter, um, but then always have a place to come back home to. I was never really looking for remote work or looking to have a digital nomad lifestyle. It was never a term that I was familiar with, but I fell into a remote job after graduating with a business degree. Um, the company actually selected three people from around the world to um, participate in a fully paid trip where we would go around the world <laughs> visiting different companies that are at the cutting edge of technology. So, for example, one of them would be Emirates Airline in, um, in Dubai. So after a summer of travel, uh, the internship ended with a full time remote job. And it was at that point that I actually thought the remote work was a con because I had gone from the stimulation of university right into working remotely from home, which at the time was moving back into my family's uh, home. So I was, I was working alone from their basement mm -hmm. <laughs> and I found it very difficult, but then soon realized that remote work means you can truly work anywhere. I was working for a global company. And so I took my first trip to Costa Rica and worked from there for two weeks, which then ended up spurring the next seven years of travel and working from different locations around the world, usually for several months at a time. And that's how I got started with this lifestyle. And now I continue to live it as well. I have my apartment um, that I come back to usually just for the summers and then often spend my winters um, at different places around the world with my most frequent place. And the place that I love most at the moment uh, for living is Vietnam. And then, Naman, I know you have a very different story from me. You grew up with um, a lot more of a global experience than I did, uh, and then recently went full nomad, which is quite extreme. So maybe you can introduce yourself and describe a little bit more about that one. Yeah, thanks, Megan. I've, I've definitely learned. I haven't been nomadic, I guess, for as long in the recent years as, as you have. So I've definitely learned a decent amount from your experience, too. Uh, so just a bit of background about myself. Uh, I was born in India and uh, my parents were expatriates. So uh, about a year after I was born, I, I moved out uh, to, to Nigeria and spent essentially the next couple decades uh, moving every two to three years. Uh, a fun fact about my childhood is uh, I lived in seven countries before university and uh, went to 11 schools. So I was essentially changing uh, schools almost every, every couple, less than every couple of years which at the time wasn't super fun. But looking back, I, I got a lot of sort of different types of experiences that I, that I now cherish. Um, and so I, I think after I came to the US to study uh, at university, um, I studied uh, robotics. Um, and after university, I kind of had a knack to uh, go into product uh, and actually made the switch to uh, management consulting. Um, and so I worked as a management consulting for, uh, for McKinsey based out of New York. Um, and even with that role, I was based in New York, but I was traveling a lot to see clients and work with clients. Uh, when, 
essentially about two years ago uh, after COVID hit, um, uh, this I, I didn't know remote work was that big of a thing uh, uh, before, or it wasn't that big of a thing before then. And I was introduced to remote work uh, in 2020 after COVID hit. Uh, and I really kind of enjoyed the flexibility that it offered uh, and eventually found my current role at Safety Wing, which is, uh, which is fully remote and it's a global team. And once I did that, I essentially um, decided to go fully nomadic. So I, I got rid of my apartment in New York and started traveling. And I've been doing that for the last 18 months. And it's been a, a really fun journey, both working and uh, and uh, traveling to different places. Uh, so yeah, I, I, it's been, I think both of us had some very interesting experiences. Uh, and I, there's a few things that we can kind of uh, dig into here. Uh, I, I think one thing that's worth highlighting, Megan, I'd love to learn more about how you've decided and, and chosen the places that you've decided to nomad in. Um in terms of where you choose to work remotely, I would say that's actually probably one of the most common questions that I get um, for where you go and then also how you build a community there. So my first time working remotely, I just chose a place that I knew was going to have stable internet because there was a co-working space um, connected to this hostel in Costa Rica that had amazing reviews. So I started working from there for two weeks when I just wanted to trial to see if I could truly do my remote job from somewhere other than home. And I could, <laughs> but the drawback was there weren't very many other people that were doing it. So there wasn't that community. Um, when I got home from that trip, I learned about the term digital nomad, Googled it and was absolutely blown away that there are people, people that want to do what I want to do, but they're already doing it. And I realized there were hot spots around the world. Um, the first one that I came up with was in Spain in Las Palmas because I had listened to a um, a digital nomad podcaster. And he mentioned there was quite the community there. And from there, I met a ton of people that were just raving about Chiang Mai in Thailand. So I ended up going and living in Thailand for a few months. Um, in Thailand, they have co-working coffee chats. So they essentially have uh, meetups that are set up specifically for digital nomads and remote workers that are living in the city of Chiang Mai in Thailand. Um, and weekly events. So I started getting involved in those. And from there, I learned about all of the groups there are around the world. And then when it came to choosing my next locations, I would often go where other remote workers were because it was a good indication that it was going to be affordable, nice weather, safe, and then community and expat friendly. So I'd say my biggest source of new destinations is a website called Nomad List that's going to rank different digital nomad countries and cities around the world. And then I would go on Facebook groups and I would type in the city's name followed by digital nomad. And if it was a digital nomad friendly spot, there was almost always a Facebook group um, that was active. And that would be the community that I would tap into to learn about things like the Chiang Mai coffee chats where I could meet other people. So it was very research based and strategic on the locations that I went to, especially when I was starting out. Uh, for you, Naman, in the last 18 months, how did you choose your first location and where was it? And then did you have any regrets? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I, I'd say, I think I'd caveat this where um, we'll get into this a bit later in the conversation, but safety wing, um, talks, uh, Safety Wing has these annual gatherings uh, with uh, team members. And what I've found is we do these uh, roughly two to three times a year. Uh, and I found that planning around those annual gatherings has been like a really helpful way for me to uh, figure out my destinations. So the first gathering we had was uh, when I, after I joined was in Slovenia. And so I wanted to really check out this hotspot, uh, Nomad hotspot, which has been Lisbon. Uh, and, and that's where I kind of ended up going I found another person at Safety Wing who wanted to go there. So we both decided to go check it out together, which was really, uh, really fun. And I kind of had that like comfort zone to start out with, but then also was in a new place where I got to meet a lot of new people. Uh, I, I will say, I think uh, taking uh, taking almost a, a step back is uh, from how you pick a place. Uh, one thing it's worth realizing is that if you, I used to do a lot of research in like picking these places. Uh, but if you end up picking a place and you don't like it, uh, you can always uh, pack up and go to another place. I think that's one of the benefits of being a nomad, right? You can be very flexible um, and, and setting up for that is, is very important. And so just being open minded that you might be going into a place where you don't have like a ticket booked for the next place is, is very important. So because you never know what might click, uh, you might really love one place and, and just end up staying there. Uh, or or vice versa, and so I think that's that was definitely very important to me. But a lot of the factors that you talked about, 
were were quite similar to me and, and community was i think very important um and that's why i think it's like worth digging into the community aspect of, of things as well uh I, i'm really curious about how I, I think you've done this very well from what i've seen uh where you you've managed to create a community uh as a digital nomad in, in multiple places that that you've been to uh, so I'm curious how you ended up uh, doing that and what did you find in creating that community? Yeah, it was definitely out of necessity. So I'm quite introverted by nature and um, <laughs> being a digital nomad too, or even just working remotely when you're working from home, it can be so easy um, and sometimes tempting. Even after a long day of work, I like to recharge on my own usually. <laughs> so I was tending to isolate myself. And that's just magnified when you're in a new place where you don't know anyone because you don't have your family or your friends around saying, let's hang out tonight. They all know that you are somewhere else in the world. So it can be very easy to almost hide, to do your work and then to hide away. Yeah. So knowing this about myself and knowing how important it is to connect with other people uh, in terms of professional opportunities and then your own personal happiness, I had to put things in place so I would join these communities. Um, usually for me, that involves signing up for things in advance. That way there's an expectation, or at least there is in my mind that there's an expectation that um, I'm going to show up. I do this mainly with joining uh, fitness groups around the world. So instead of just joining a gym, I will sign up specifically for the weightlifting class or the yoga class and then meet people through that. And then something else I found is that there's some places I've been. So Da Nang in Vietnam, where I love and I've spent a few Canadian winters there. Um, there weren't always groups for the things that I wanted to do. But there were groups where all the expats and digital nomads could communicate together online. So I would end up starting groups on my own. Um, I organized trips once I had been there for a while and I knew the area a little bit better and I had some connections for transport and um, being able to organize the logistics of different things for expat groups. And then also I, I do YouTube where I document a lot of my travels and mostly focus on travel tips and hacks for other people. Um, so I started actually a YouTube group, a YouTube mastermind there, and other expat creators would get together with me on a weekly basis, and we would just talk about what we were creating, what we were building, and it was really just a great added social aspect. So I would say, focus on the hobbies that you have, um, know yourself, <laughs> and then if there isn't the type of community or the group that you want, it's typically a pretty open-minded group of people, and you would be surprised that there's someone else that even if they don't particularly love what you are putting out, they do want to connect. So it's pretty easy to get a group together in that sense. Uh, something else I've been interested in is actually traveling to specific locations for specific activities. And I think, Naman, you did that to some extent with um, with surfing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I think that's uh, that's a great example. So one of the things that you talked about that uh, is, is very interesting to me is when I first started uh, solo traveling, I uh, thought that I, I'm more of an extrovert and I was already having kind of fear of missing out. I, I really like my life in New York. And when I left, it was actually quite difficult for me, but I wanted to experience this, this new change. Um, and so I, I kind of, one way I got over that was just saying, hey, it's only for four months. If I don't like it, I'll come back. But mm -hmm. I ended up loving it. Um, so that's another thing I think I'd like to highlight. But uh, what I, when I first started out, uh, it was, I remember in Thailand and uh, I had this kind of goal of meeting other people because I thought that that was like very important to me. I didn't want to just do things solo and do activity solo. What I ended up finding out was the best way to meet people is just to do things that you're interested in with other people. So like you talked about uh, fitness groups and things uh, in Lisbon, uh, a friend, uh, friend asked me if I wanted to go surfing and on a whim, I said, yes, uh, never having like looked up uh, how to surf before, uh, let alone knowing how to surf. Uh, it ended up being one of my favorite things that I learned that year. And I kind of got hooked uh, in just a two day period. Uh, and so I will, I would typically, and then I went back to Costa Rica uh, to surf there, I've surfed in a couple other places. And I always uh, look for opportunities to, to do that. And so I think just looking for things that you're interested in and finding a community around that is, is always uh, helpful. And uh, the reason I like that is um, if you don't end up, say you going, end up going to a fitness class, uh, if you don't end up meeting someone there, uh, it's still a win-win because you ended up doing something that you like for an hour. And so I think that's that's a really important uh, factor uh, in, in just establishing the community. Um, and yeah, I, I think uh, 
maybe we should spend a little bit time and like switch gears to how we work as digital nomads. So obviously we get all these new experiences, uh, but at the same time as digital nomads and remote workers, you're typically uh, you're working a full-time job. Um, and in, in Megan's case, for example, was also running a YouTube channel, essentially two full-time jobs. So I'd love to learn, learn from you, Megan, on what are some of the things you do to be able to be productive when you're going to a new place? Yeah, I'd say there's two things that I need to do every time I go to a new place. But something to keep in mind with this is that I keep a lot of my routines and these schedule tips that I'm about to go into consistent. So even if I'm in Canada today and let's say I'm working from Thailand next week, a lot of my working routines, um, how I like to work, where I like to work, these things remain consistent. So it's a new environment, but the work life is not always changing. Okay. I'd say the first thing is to be absolutely ruthless with your schedule. So with our um, work at Safety Wing, we are a global team and it ends up actually being a huge benefit because we also have global customers. Um, and then we have the global mindset too and our products are global. So we are users of our own products and we're building things that we understand and that we use ourselves. Um, so it's a big benefit but it means that your hours might be changing. So whenever I go to a new location, I will set my working hours and then I will be strict and firm with them, not just in the way that I communicate, but also um, I find it actually most challenging to be firm with myself to, to do things like remove the apps from my phone so I'm not looking at work information on off work time. And then I'll also do things like schedule emails so that they're being sent out during my working hours, even if I was doing them um, a little bit earlier at other times, something with this digital nomad lifestyle and the flexibility of remote work is that you can do things like take a few hours off in the afternoon and then come back in the evening and continue working just based on your own productivity and also the things that you want to do at different times. Um, so definitely removing any of these work apps from my phone so that they're not there when I am in my personal time, uh, being ruthless with my schedule. And then the other thing that I do that I find extremely helpful is having a separate place to work. That could be a separate place inside of your apartment. Often if you're in a studio or one bedroom or you have a partner there with you, it's not always feasible. So going to a coffee shop or a co-working space and knowing that you are going there to do your work and that is all. You're not going there to half be on Facebook. Um, it's work time and you associate that environment with your working time. And those are the things I've done to maintain some level of, or a good level of productivity, uh, even in different environments. Yeah, thanks for that. Those, those are some awesome, awesome tips. And I, I kind of wish I was as disciplined as, as you, but I essentially try to, I strive to create that that same environment uh, for myself. I, I realize we've talked a little bit about safety wing, and I think maybe it's helpful to understand uh, let's talk a little bit about what Safety Wing is. Uh, this is a company that we both work for. Um, we are a fully distributed uh, global remote company. We were both uh, pretty early employees and have seen the growth uh, of, of this company. Mm -hmm. And I think we've kind of both gathered some uh, some strong lessons on um, on how to kind of create a very good culture around remote work and uh, the kind of needs and demands of remote workers as well, because they are our customers. Mm -hmm. So just to give the folks here a background, uh, Safety Wing is a startup that was founded in, in 2018. Uh, we went through Y Combinator back in 2018, and the goal of this company has been to build a social, global social safety net. So if you think about uh, there are certain countries like Norway, they provide certain benefits to their citizens. And uh, with the kind of new remote work era, there's uh, companies that are hiring, hiring globally but a lot of the benefits are pretty local. And so we want to enable these companies to provide benefits globally. Uh, and our first product was actually a, a product a product for digital nomads who were traveling more frequently. So it was a short-term travel insurance. And then we actually moved on to uh, Remote Health, which is our more um, company-focused product where we allow companies to provide health insurance to uh, people in, in 185 plus, plus countries. Um, and that's the product both Megan and I work on uh, within a subset of that. Uh, and so we've both, I think since we've been at the company, we've seen the company scale from, I think, uh, below for Megan, uh, for you, it was even like 15 people up to 150 people, uh, now. And so I'd love to learn about how, how do you think like safety wing, uh, has kept the culture together? Let's talk a little bit about that. I'm curious on your thoughts there. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. And I sometimes forget that. So Naman, you've been with the company now close to two years, a year and a half. Two, yeah. Yeah, about a year and a half. Yeah. yeah. And and I've been with Safety Wing now, uh, at least in some capacity for about three years. So it really was seeing it go from a very, very tiny startup to where we are now. And most of that growth happened in the last year, which has been <laughs> wild to go through. I'd say that one of Safety Wing's biggest strengths is that they actually started as a remote company right from the beginning. We were remote first. So it wasn't like in 2020 when so many companies were forced to go remote and they ended up having um, their teams being distributed, working from home, but they didn't have those processes in place. So we had remote first processes and um, a culture of mainly async work in place before we started to scale. And it, so it wasn't like we were all together in an office, we all of a sudden went home and we didn't have any of those systems. So we've been able to scale these systems as we've grown, um, which I think is what has helped us become a, a lot more successful as this now much larger company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anything to add to that, Namon? Yeah, I, I think that that's a really good point, but starting remote versus going remote. Uh, so we optimize our systems for that. I think some of the systems I'd like to highlight, for example, it, there's really no replacement for in-person uh, time. And so what a lot of remote companies, a lot of good remote companies do is they'll ha host gatherings uh, uh, with their company. So we alluded to this earlier where Safety Wing does two to three gatherings a year. And another formal part of our policy is uh, if, if members want to co-work with each other, they, we have a budget to allow them to do that, to co-locate and co-work for a little bit. So we've seen some people use that essentially like our, for example, our product team to get together uh, in a house somewhere uh, in, in a great location and just hack for, for a few weeks and, and really increases output and also increases camaraderie within, within the team. Um, and I think because of some of these things that we do, um, I found that I'm very, very close to a lot of uh, safety wing people. Uh, and have become very good friends with them, which I did not expect as much from uh, from a remote first uh, company. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think that's that's uh, that's been really amazing. Um, and another thing I'd like to highlight is that um, it, it was a very important thing to our founders to keep our mission and values intact. Um, and so those things are talked about regularly in meetings, on Slack, uh, in onboarding. It's a part of the process. And that helps as the company scales beyond a certain point where you can have meetings with the whole company uh, that helps to keep everyone basically going towards the same mission or vision. Um, and I definitely see that at, at Safety Wing. Uh, so uh, I think that's, th those are sort of some of the specific things around what Safety Wing's done uh, yeah. to scale. I think those, those gatherings have been key to have that in-person connection, even if it is only a few times a year, it makes a huge difference. Um, but then also when we're not at these gatherings and we are all working from around the world, it's not just a complete free-for-all. Uh, we do have some structure in place in terms of rules around, uh, even if we're working async, we try to answer Slack messages during working hours within a 24-hour period. Um, and then we also have core hours. So we have four core hours um, every week that's expected, uh, two hours on Monday and two hours on Thursday, where the whole company, if you are not on vacation, is expected to be online and working towards um, setting our goals for the week and looking at our goals within our own departments, as well as solving bigger company problems together. So for example, if I know that my core hour is going to be 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but I still decide to go live in Vietnam for the winter, I have to know that I'm going to be working those hours late at night and be okay with that. So we know that we have this set time. Again, it's only four core hours a week, um, but something that we anticipate and have to work around in how we build our different lifestyles. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think mo moving maybe even a bit higher level there, uh, why do you think um, remote work is, is good for the world? What are some of the big positives out of it? <laughs> because um, I would say it's for opportunity growth. Uh, companies are starting to realize that you don't necessarily need to find your best developers within two miles of your San Francisco office. So, <laughs> so it's definitely creating opportunities uh, for more people around the world. And then, I mean, after 2020, after COVID, it, this remote lifestyle is more and more common and being able to facilitate that freedom um, and more people learning from travel too and expanding our worldviews, more products 
being global and better understanding your customers because you are also living as a global citizen. These are all just benefits. Uh, we see it so much in safety wing. There's ideas and worldviews. Um, all are very respected, but many of them are quite different <laughs> and they are continuing to evolve. The more that we travel, the more that we are in touch with each other. So I, I think it just helps with our creativity. Um, and then again, little benefits like being able to reach reach customers all over the world because we are all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there was one, this speaking to your first point, there's this one uh, study that I really, uh, really liked from uh, venture capital firms. So it's not just the talent that's global, but also innovation is becoming decentralized. So mm -hmm. a lot of venture capital firms were finding that, especially, I think the study was maybe based in the U S but it's same phenomenon kind of across the world where their biggest location that they used to fund went from like San Francisco, the Bay Area to uh, remote uh, ended up being like twice the size of San Francisco in terms of the companies that they funded, uh, which is really exciting to see that. I mean, people anywhere kind of have talent and are able to build great companies. And, and that's just, I think, a super exciting trend. It, yeah, no, I completely agree. And I also think because we are normalizing remote work at this point, I believe it can just be called work. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's bringing more benefits to the people that are employed remotely. So in the past, I would almost say that having a remote job in itself is the perk. It's like listed as one of the benefits you get to work remotely. But now that's not enough. Now it's not considered a replacement for things like benefits. And there are so many companies out there that are making it um, more accessible for employers to be able to provide things like benefits and pension plans, um, health insurance like with Safety Wing to their uh, employees or their contractors around the world, there almost isn't an excuse. And if you want to be a competitive employer and you want to keep up, you need to be offering these things as well. So that's bringing benefits to people that may have not ever had access to them in the past. Yeah. And I, I think maybe uh, coming coming here to a bit of a close, I'd, I'd love to just talk a little bit about the uh, what you mentioned there is like, there's been so much activity in the space and how companies have been enabling it, how like the new companies have been coming on uh, to uh, to solve these problems. Uh, when, when you think about hiring someone, there's typically kind of two problems that um, that a company looks at when hiring an employee. Uh, that's that's payroll and and providing them benefits. This is what they kind of need to hire a, a good good talent. Um, and during COVID, there were a whole host of companies that uh, just solved this like very acute problem of being able to hire um, someone and pay them uh, across the world. Um, and they made it as easy as essentially using like a SaaS tool. Um, and uh, there are a bunch of companies at this, this conference that have done that and, and done it very well, uh, mm -hmm. where Safety Wing is trying to come in and solve the second pillar of that problem, which is uh, global benefits. And so what we found that um, health insurance is one of kind of the four key benefits that employees want uh, after essentially after pay. Um, and we, uh, we've, that's why we built kind of this global health insurance product. We have others in the pipeline, uh, that are essentially other benefits. And then we started partnering with, um, these other companies that have figured out the payroll solution. Um, and essentially, uh, we started partnering with these other HR and, and freelancer platforms. And this is what both Meg Megan and I work on. Actually, uh, we, we started kind of this team, um, that, uh, leads these partnerships with uh, HR and employer of record companies, freelancer platforms to be able to provide their customers access to health insurance. Uh, and today we have 60 partners and it's it's growing pretty quickly. And uh, I think all of them are amazing in their own right. Uh, so it, it's a really exciting space and, and we're, we're pretty excited to see how it grows. Yeah. And just to bring that full circle, I mean, Safety Wing's mission is to provide a social safety net. So all those aspects you mentioned, like insurance, um, to everyone, <laughs> everyone in the world. So from my time with the company, we've seen it go from where we would work directly with remote employers to be able for, to help them, to enable them to cover all of their remote employees under one health insurance plan so they can provide that benefit to them. But then like Naman mentioned on the platforms team, partnering with these human resource companies uh, and platforms, we're able to reach many, many companies under one single plan too. So it's just further simplifying. And now we've moved into the freelancer space as well. So it's not just remote employees that can be covered, but it's that individual remote freelancer that is now able to cover themselves and their family 
through our partnerships with different freelance platforms. So um, whether it's Safety Wing or any of the other companies that are actually participating in this uh, Evolve Beyond Borders conference as well, it really is um, all technology that is making it seamless, easy, and almost expected now that everyone can receive the benefits that they need, regardless of where you live in the world. Um, awesome. Yeah, I think this is uh, one thing to one thing just to quickly add to that, uh, Megan, is uh, and this is, I guess, personally exciting to me is from from a product standpoint, the way we're doing that and the way I think we're seeing it happen uh, is to end users. We want the solution to be as simple as possible on the back end. For example, uh, Safety Wing saw this opportunity for for building an API. Um, so the user at the end of the day is coming to um, these HR platforms and they want that to be kind of their one source of truth. Uh, it's just a much better user experience for them than like going to five different products. Um, and so uh, Safety Wing has built this API that our partners use uh, where you can kind of get the functionality of health insurance embedded in their dashboard uh, provided by Safety Wing. And so uh, that's I, that's also something very excited uh, that I'm personally very excited about. We've seen that trend already happen in uh, in fintech and some payment providers and kind of the world is heading towards that. And uh, it, I think it's exciting to see that coming to health insurance and, and payroll and, and some of these other areas as well. Um, and I, I think with that, uh, maybe we should uh, wrap up our discussion. I, I think, uh, do you have any closing thoughts, Megan? I think you just covered it with that. Definitely very excited to see where this goes in the future, how remote work continues to evolve over the next five, 10 years. Uh, it's crazy how fast technology is moving now and we all have this on our mind. Remote work is no longer um, a niche topic. So, so very excited to see what's going to happen over the next decade. Yeah, same here. Uh, thanks again for having us. Yeah, thank you. Bye.